like him has to provide like him and has to give you guidance like him and no one in this universe can do that not even a close and dear angel nor a close and dear messenger this is why allah the almighty may forgive all types of sins it's up to his divine will you can be a murderer and allah forgives that a man killed a hundred soul and sought redemption and forgiveness and allah forgive forgave him you can commit all heinous acts and still allah forgives that except shirk except associating others with allah except disbelieving in allah and his attributes if one does this and dies doing this allah azza wa jal would never ever admit him to jannah and he would be admitted to hellfire without any chance of leaving that the evidences are overwhelming Allah Azza wa Jal says that the masjids, the mosques, are for Allah alone, so invoke not anyone along with Allah. And this clearly indicates that Allah Azza wa Jal does not advocate, uh, does not permit people to associate others with Him. And the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, said in an authentic hadith, whoever meets Allah Azza wa Jal and he does not associate others with Him, he will be admitted to paradise. And whoever associate others with Allah Azza wa Jal, he would be thrown into hell. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect us all. Okay. Now, third, whoever obeys the messenger, that is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and singles out Allah in worship, it is not permissible for him to take as allies those who oppose Allah and his messenger, not even if they are close relatives. Okay, this is an issue known as al-wala wal bara which is a very essential and important issue in Islam. What is al-wala wal bara Al-wala is allegiance to take someone and to give him your allegiance. So if he needs help or protection, you provide that for him. This is al-wala. And Allah Azza wa Jal is the ally of the believers. And the believers, men and women, are ally one to the other. So the issue of allegiance is extremely important as important as distancing yourself from the disbelievers which is known as al bara you have to announce that we are not like the disbelievers and they are not like us and this is extremely important to understand and to know from the religion of islam so many people because of their ignorance they think that islam is just simply praying and fasting ramadan and that's it we can be like them we can dress like them we can talk like them while in the quran in the prophet's hadith sallallahu alaihi wa wasallam you would find that this is something that cannot be accepted and it is part of the essence of the deen so you must not take those people close to you even if they were your relatives what is the ayah nasser now the proof is you will not find any people who believe in Allah and the last day, making friendship with those who oppose Allah and his messenger, even if they are their fathers or their sons or their brothers, 
all their kindred for such he is he has written faith in their in their heart and strengthened them with the ruh, light and guidance from himself and he will admit them into the gardens underneath which rivers flow to dwell therein forever allah is pleased with them and they with him the other part they are the party of allah verily it is the party of allah that will be the successful very good this ayah is in surah Al -al 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 -mujadala, the last ayah of Surah Al-Mujadala. Now, the translation is not accurate. You, Muhammad, will not find any people who believe in Allah and the last day making friendship. This is not an accurate translation of the word where Allah says, لا تجد قوما يؤمنون بالله ويوم الآخر يوادون من حاد الله ورسوله With is not something that is prohibited. With is a sort of a friendship with conditions. Now, what we're not allowed to take the non-Muslims as allies, as confidants, as close people to us more than the Muslims. And the ayah is crystal clear. Even if these people were to be your fathers, sons, brothers, and your kindred, as long as they oppose Islam and they are enemies of Islam, and this is what you understand from the word had Allah wa Rasulah, those who oppose Allah. Not any person who does not want to believe. So yes, we th there are non-Muslims who don't want to believe in Allah or in the Prophet or in the Day of Judgment. But they are not enemies of Islam. They're kind to Muslims. They respect Islam. They never insult Islam. Such peoples, we can take them as friends, not close allies not confidants, but their acquaintances. We say good morning to them in the morning. We send them food in Ramadan as a gift. We congratulate them when it is our Eid, not their festivals, because this is not permissible. If they were blessed with a child, we congratulate them. There's nothing wrong in that in Islam at all. What is wrong is to take those who oppose Allah and the Messenger والسلام, as friends. And this is the third matter, which is extremely important, which is uh, uh, so clear in the Quran and so clear in the Sunnah that a lot of the people, due to their ignorance and lack of knowledge, don't know of it. Now, I know that the people of Nigeria have strong Iman, but through Twitter, I've also found out that a lot of them are ignorant. Maybe they would come publicly and say statements that would be very difficult for, for them to retract off. They would say things that children know as basics in Islam. And this is, no, no, this is not logical. How can uh, uh, Islam say this? This is uh, fabrication. This is this. And they insult and they humiliate and they ridicule something that is from part of the basics of Islam. So I know people now would listen to my talk and say, oh, this is causing disunity. Akhi, don't mix apples with oranges. Nobody is making disunity. This is the religion of Allah. So Allah tells us in black and white, we must not take them as allies. They're not Muslims. But Islam doesn't tell us to cut their throats. Islam doesn't tell us to spit in their faces when they see them. This is not how the Prophet used to deal with them. The Prophet used to deal with them with a lot of dignity and honor, meaning he would not bow his head to them, never. Now we see the Muslims kissing their boots, let alone bowing to them. So Islam tells you, be kind to them. But at the same time, Preserve your honor and the dignity of Islam.
So you should not be violent. You should not be rude or abusive. When they're kind to you, be kind to them. As long as they do not oppose Islam and Allah and the Messenger and the Day of Judgment. Now, listen to this ayah in Surah Al Mumtahina, verse number four, chapter number 60. You can read it yourself later on. 460. Allah says, there has already been for you an excellent pattern in Ibrahim and those with him. Okay, Allah is telling us, telling Muhammad, it says the recording has stopped. Nasser, you guys still can hear me? Okay, then I will continue, inshallah. So Allah Azza wa Jal is addressing Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and giving him an example to follow. Allah says, there has already been for you an excellent pattern in Ibrahim and those with him. When they said to their people, Ibrahim's people said to their own people, indeed, we are disassociated. We are disassociated from you and from whatever you worship other than Allah. Okay, so this disassociation is part of Al Bara. We're telling you, we are not alike. You are from our people. We have the same nationality. We speak the same language, but you have a different faith. So we're disassociated with any other thing that you worship other than Allah what's next they say we have denied you and there has appeared between us and you animosity and hatred forever until you believe in Allah alone what a strong message to be said this is a declaration of faith. This is what we believe. We're not going to beat around the bush. We believe in Allah Azza wa Jal. If you want to share our belief, you are more than welcome. We become brothers and sisters. But if you refuse, in this case, we have to part our ways because you have your own religion and we have our own religion. Okay. Are you back? Yes, I'm back. Um, okay. Now we're going to know that may Allah grant you the ability to obey him, that Abu Hanifa, the religion of Ibrahim, is that you worship Allah alone, making the religion sincere. That is solely for him. This Can you read, 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 read this again, please? No. May Allah grant you the ability to obey him, that... Al Hanifa, the religion of Al Ibrahim. Okay. Al Hanifiya. No. Al Hanifiya, by the way, has nothing to do with Abu Hanifa, the Imam. Al Hanifiya is to tell it and not to be straight. That's strange because we thought that Islam was always about being straight. Yes, to be tilted, deviated from the way of shirk. This is why it's called Al Hanifiyya to Samha. This is the religion of Islam since the time of Adam till the time of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. May Allah be pleased, peace and blessing be upon them all. So it is tilted, and this usually refers to the religion of Ibrahim, the father of all messengers. So the Sheikh, the Imam, says, acknowledge, may Allah guide you to obeying him. That Al Hanifiyya. This pure aqeedah is the religion of Ibrahim. Okay, then what is the religion of Ibrahim? The Imam says mm -hmm. that you worship Allah alone, making the religion sincerely for Him. This is what Allah ordered all of mankind to do, and this is okay. The so, so what is if someone says to you, what is 
the Hanafiya? What is the religion of Ibrahim? What is the religion of all messengers of Allah? The answer is very simple. It is to worship Allah alone sincerely. And sincerity in Arabic is Al-Ikhlas. Do you know a chapter in the Quran by the name of Surah Al-Ikhlas? Um, Nasser? Yes. Which is? No, the one before that by two chapters. This is called Surah Al-Ikhlas, the chapter of sincerity. What, what sincerity? Say Allah is one. Allah is Samad, the one that all people go to or direct their prayers to for asking him for their needs. He's not begotten, begotten and does not beget. And no one is like him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is called al-ikhlas. So to worship Allah Azza wa Jal, it's not just to pray and fast and do these rituals, which is pillars of Islam. You will not be accepted until you have sincerity in your heart. Sincerity in forms of worship. One says, Sheikh, I'm a friend of uh, a brother Ibrahim. Because he has a beautiful car. I'm not sincere, so I will be in hell. No, this is not a worship. It's, it might be sinful. You might be using him. But this is not a breach of sincerity which will admit you to hellfire. We're talking about sincerity of your ibadah, of your worship. Why are you fasting? You, because of Ramadan? I said, no, I'm, I've gained weight, so everybody's fasting. So I'm joining them so that I would lose weight. So it's not for Allah? Um, no, I don't think so. Why are you praying? I haven't seen you pray in the masjid for ages. He said, my boss is joining us for prayer, so I wanted him to see me pray next to him so that he would give me a raise. And all of this is a breach of sincerity that is unacceptable, none whatsoever. So the religion of Ibrahim dependent on Worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal with sincerity. And this is what Allah has instructed all of humanity. Not only that, this is what why Allah created all of hum humanity. Yes, Sakhi. Now, Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ And I did not create jinn and mankind except to worship me. Okay, to, to worship me, what does this mean? This means is to single me out in worship. Ah, so Allah created the jinn and the ins so that they can worship him. Now, some of them did worship him. Others did not worship him. So they disobeyed Allah Azza wa Jal. Was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unable to force them? Of course, he was able to force them, but he gave them the choice. And Allah gave the choice to all humans, whether to worship him or to disbelieve, to disbelieve and end up in hellfire. So the choice is yours. And this is the meaning of worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal. That is to single him out in worship. And this is why we have to know the meaning of Tawheed. Tawheed has three meanings. Meaning number one, or three branches, three types. There is Tawheed al rububiyyah There is Tawheed al uluhiyya And there is Tawheed Al-Asma wa Sifat. Sheikh, we don't speak Arabic. Can you please translate? Okay, wait, wait. Why are you rushing? We have all day long. It's almost four hours for iftar. Don't, don't rush things. And besides, this is free. So I'm not charging you for it. Alhamdulillah, except from Allah. So, Tawheed number one is the Tawheed of Lordship. What do you mean by Tawheed? Tawheed is to single Allah out 
with which no one can share with him. Okay, singling Allah out with what, what no one else can share with him. Can you elaborate? I will, inshallah. Number one, Tawheed of Lordship. How do we single Allah out in his Lordship? First of all, we have to acknowledge, as we stated before, that Allah is the creator. Okay, this is easy. And that Allah is the sustainer. He provides us with all what we need. Definitely. And that Allah is the owner. And these are powerful words. Doesn't seem powerful for me, Sheikh. He created us. He sustains us. He owns us. No, it is powerful because if you contemplate upon it, being the owner, I can do whatever I want with what I own. So if I take my mobile and I toss it against the wall to break into pieces, this is mine. No one can say, why did you do this? I'll report you to the police. Allah Azza wa Jal has no one to be reported to. He's the supreme, subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he were to take all of humanity, all of this universe, all of the jinn and the angels and whatever he created and throw them into hell, not a single person or soul could object to that because he owns you and he has the power to do whatever he wants with you. So when you acknowledge his lordship, that no one creates but him, no one provides but him, no one sustains but him, and that he's the owner and that he is the giver of life and he's the taker of life. He's the one who facilitates our affairs. I can't go from point A to point B without his permission and planning and enabling me to do so. So this is Tawheed of Lordship. No one has argued about this Tawheed, even idol worshippers. When you ask them, who created the heavens and the earth? The idol worshippers would say, Allah. Who brings rain from the heavens? They wouldn't say idol number one or Buddha or our cow. They would say, Allah. Who created you? Allah. Who made this world possible to live on? Allah. Everything. You will find this so many times repeated in the Quran. So this is Tawheed of Lordship. The second type of Tawheed is the Tawheed that wars were initiated to protect. The blood was shed because of their defiance and not willing to accept. And that is the Tawheed of worship. So we single out Allah Azza wa Jal in worshiping him. We pray only to Allah. We seek forgiveness only from Allah. We fast only to Allah. We sacrifice and offer sacrifices only to Allah Azza wa Jal. When we seek refuge, we seek refuge in Allah. And when we supplicate and invoke, we supplicate and invoke only Allah. This division of Tawheed is what the idol worshippers fought against. And they said, Subhanallah, they didn't say that. This is from me. And they said, had he, that is Muhammad, made all the gods one that we don't worship except one, this is something weird. So this type of Tawheed is what most of our da'wah revolves around because the vast majority of people are believers in Allah, in his existence, in his powers to create, to own, to sustain, to provide, to give life and to take it. But when it comes to devoting sincerely, underline, quote, bold, and make it in red flashing, 
sincerely worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal, this is where all the disputes between the messengers of Allah and the enemies of these messengers of Allah took place because of. Number three is Tawheed of Allah Azza wa Jal in his beautiful names and attributes. So we don't call Allah and we do not describe Allah except with what he himself called and described himself or his messenger called and described him the almighty Allah Azza wa Why? Because these names and attributes cannot be something that is figured out by your intellect. It has to be a revelation. We did not see Allah Azza wa Jal, so we cannot talk about him without proper evidence that is backed by Quran and Sunnah. Even the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, don't have the authority to describe Allah or to give names to Allah if it were not backed by the Quran and by the Sunnah. Yes, Akhi. The greatest thing that Allah commanded is Tawheed, which means singling out Allah in worship. And the greatest thing that Allah warned against is shirk, which is supplicating to others other than Him. And the proof for this is Allah's statement, Wa'abudullaha wa la And worship Allah alone and do not mix anything in worship with him. And if it is said to you, what are the three fundamental principles that mankind is obliged? Okay, let, let, let us, let us, uh, Nasser, let us stop here. So the evidence is crystal clear. The cardinal sin, as they call it in, in, in Catholicism, which is associating others with Allah, shirk. This is something that Allah Azza wa Jal does not accept or forgive. So all what you study and learn from Aqeedah is one, who your Lord is, two, what your religion is, three, who your messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is and what did he teach you. If you combine all these three and implement them in your life, you will find that you have become a proper Muslim and that ibadah of Allah Azza wa Jal is according to what pleases Allah and you're bound to hit paradise with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. Now, I think we should stop here, if you guys don't mind, because we'll be beginning a new chapter and we would uh, like to devote uh, more time for that. So uh, what do you say, say, Sheikh Nasser? Should we go to the questions? Yes, yes, sure, Sheikh, inshallah. I'll read the question out for you now. Right? So the first question is, uh, Sheikh, my mother is a patient suffering from urine, urinary bladder cancer. Now she has a new pathway for urine in which her urine goes to, ba to a bag and not through natural pathway. She wants to know if her bag comes full of urine and when she drains that urine, is her wudu broken or and to make a new wudu? Okay. And please ask the Sheikh to pray for her. Yeah. First of all, I pray to Allah Azza wa Jal, the Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one that holds everything in his hands to cure your mother and to make this something that erases her sins, the previous and the upcoming, and to grant her the patience and the content to be content with whatever Allah Azza wa Jal decrees upon her. Allah is most hearing and most seeing. Secondly, what your mother is suffering from, this was described by the scholars of fiqh as someone who has urinary incontinence. And incontinence means that urine comes out without being able to control it. So what is to be done? Scholars say for people who are similar to your mother's case, that this is beyond your control. And due to the issue, whenever it becomes so tight, Islam 
widens it up. And now it's very hard and tight. So how does Islam treat this? Well, scholars say that if it is time for dhuhr and the adhan is called for dhuhr and you empty this bag, you wash the areas afflicted by urine and you perform wudu. You can pray dhuhr, you can pray sunnah, you can pray istikhara, you can read the mushaf, you can do anything you want until the time of, the, of Asr. But Sheikh, I can see urine coming out, no problem. Your wudu is still intact. Once Asr time is due, you want to pray Asr, you have to renew the process and perform wudu. And you can go on until sunset. Once the sun sets, you have to perform wudu. And you can remain in this wudu as long as you do not defecate or pass wind or do things other than things dealing with urine. This is only because of uh, um, uh, the urine coming out issue. But if you break your wudu with other means, then your wudu breaks. So you pray Maghrib, you pray Sunnah, you can do whatever you wish until it is time for Isha. You can perform wudu, pray Isha until midnight. And then you have to perform another wudu if you want to pray night prayer. And you go on like this without any problem. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. This is shared by anyone who has urine incontinence or someone who has istihada. So she's getting brownish, yellowish discharge, though she is pure from her menses. So she acts exactly in the same fashion as mentioned before, or someone who has problem with passing wind 24 seven, the same goes for him or her and Allah knows best. All right, Sheikh, um, this question say that you spoke about being sincere totally to Allah. It is, is it permissible to record videos and show to the public when we are doing charity because the donation we receive are from public? I don't understand the question. Is it okay for her to, you know, uh, when they go for charity to make videos and make uh, pictures and then mm. share with the public because the public actually gave them the money? Okay. Yeah, I believe that videoing poor people or people in need and using their footage to draw money from the rich and make them feel sorry for how poor they are, that this is degrading and humiliating. Allah tested me with poverty. I am in need. I am a poor Muslim. But this doesn't mean that it's allowed for you to go and do whatever you want to do with my picture and my footage like that. This is haram. So some people say, okay, what about if we take their permission? Of course they will give you their permission because they want your money. So it's like forcing them to concede, to accept when they are in deep need of it. This is not fair. It's not fair for people to go and shoot, for example, um, in Syria, houses that are burnt or uh, 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 destroyed and, and, and poor people outside who've lost their loved ones crying and weeping. And we video that just to show them the atrocities that are taking place. These people have honor and dignity. And we should not do this or use that, and Allah knows best. Aisha, the next question, is it possible to make heaven if you don't believe, no, you, you don't, you neither hate Islam. If you believe your way of life is religion itself, you're kind, you're good, you're nice to people, you don't do wrong things, you don't hurt people, but you don't have a specific religion, how will Allah judge you? This is a kafir. There's no, no, no dispute in that. 
The Prophet said والسلام, in an authentic hadith, he who hears about me and does not follow me, he will be in hell forever and would not be admitted to Jannah. So no matter how nice you are, how kind, how polite, how generous to the poor, if you don't believe in Quran, if you don't believe in prayers, if you don't believe in the Sharia ah and implement it, you're doomed to hell. It doesn't matter how good you are to the people if you're not good to your creator. And without submitting your will to Allah, you have the arrogance that Satan had. Satan was among the ranks of the angels. When Allah created Adam, he told them all to prostrate. They all prostrated except Satan. So Allah says, Satan, why didn't you prostrate to what I had created with my own two hands? Satan said, I'm better than him. You created me from fire and created him from clay. So he was arrogant. He did not submit his will to Allah. And the result was that he's thrown in hell to eternity. And every single person who shares the same conviction and belief would share the same fate. Mashallah, Sheikh, how do I deal? Uh, please, how do a Muslim answer the question from an atheist who created Allah? Well, this is illogical because if there was someone to create Allah, he would not qualify to be a God. A God that is created cannot be a God because part of the description of God that he does not, that he is not created. He's one of a kind. He's the first without a beginning. He's the last without an end. This is the definition of God. So his question is not relevant it's not logical because if there were someone who created god then that someone would be god himself then we would go into the loop then who created god and then who created the one who created god then who created the one who created the one who created god all of this is nonsense god is one subhanahu wa ta'ala is not created he is not begotten and he does not beget and there is nothing like him Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ma'am, somebody can shake. There is a house with the owner buried within the compound about 15 years ago. The house is about to be sold. Please, what can we do with the grave? It cannot be sold. A house that has the grave of a Muslim buried in it cannot be sold. And this is why it is wrong for a Muslim to instruct his family to be buried in his home. Because now this becomes a sacred land that is sacred because of a Muslim's corpse inside of it. The only way I see it out for them is that they approach the Islamic court and they try to get a order from that court to remove the grave to be taken into the cemeteries of the Muslims so that they can sell that land. And this cannot only be done by a judge, a Muslim judge directive. Yeah, so Sheikh, if a person dies on Friday, what are the facilities that he will get or she will get? The Prophet told, told us والسلام, that whoever dies during the daytime of Friday or the night time of Friday. When is the night time of Friday, Sheikh Nasser? Night time of Friday? Yes. Uh, Thursday night? Correct. So the night time of the day in Islam is the night that precedes it, that comes before it. And this is cascaded throughout the whole year. And this is why Thursday night we started praying Taraweeh. Though Thursday was the 30th or the 29th of the month. And the first day of Ramadan was Friday. But the night in Islam precedes the day, except 
in one case. And that is on Arafat. The day of Arafat, once the sun sets, the night is also called the night of Arafat when we go to Muzdalifa. But this is not our topic. So what is our topic? If a person dies Thursday night or during the daytime of Friday, the Prophet gave us the glad tidings, alayhi salatu wasalam, that he will be exempted from the torment of the grave. And this is a glad tiding because this means that this person has a good ending. Yet, we have to be careful that not to jump into conclusions. So people say, oh, if he's not being tormented in his grave, then he will be admitted to paradise directly. And the answer is no. This does not mean that he would not pay for his sins in hellfire on the day of judgment. It simply means that Allah exempted him from the punishment and the torment of the grave. On the day of judgment, it depends how good or bad he was, and he would be held accountable accordingly. And Allah knows best. Nam, about donation, I accidentally donated 250 pounds to Islamic Relief, and I have an issue because I want to cancel it, but at the same time, since it's Ramadan, I shouldn't cancel the payment, even though my intention wasn't to pay 250 pounds. And it was my mistake. What should I do? What should I do? Will I get reward for not canceling the money, even though it was a mistake? If you did not cancel it, it means that you are approving it, and it will you will be rewarded for that. If you canceled it, this is your right. Nobody says that you have to go ahead with that mistake, which you did not intend. And you will be sinful if you retract it. No, there's nothing wrong in going back in it and putting that I wanted only to donate 25, not 250. There's no problem in that. Now, can one eat food in which a Christian mentioned blood of Jesus on eat before serving? Or when one is eating together, is saying Bismillah at my end sufficient to eat the food? What counts about the food, whether it's halal, or haram is the slaughtering. So if we're talking about vegetables and fruit, and some Christian says in the name of the blood of Christ, or a Buddhist said in the name of Buddha, or a Hindu says in the name of Krishna, and they present us the food, we say Bismillah and eat. Because whatever they had said does not impact the fruit or the vegetables or the candies or whatever. No problem, eat. If I have meat, so someone is serving steak, and they say, Bismillah, or they say, in the name of Jesus, or they say, in the name of Krishna, and they serve it, that does not impact the meat. What impacts the permissibility or the prohibition of consuming that meat is how it was slaughtered. So if someone while slaughtering the sheep says, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and he slaughters it, this is halal meat. If someone says, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and he stabs the sheep in the stomach or guts it out while alive, or bangs it with a hammer in the head, or suffocates it until it dies, or electrify it until it dies. All of this is called dead meat. Though he said, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, because it was not slaughtered. So the two reasons or the two conditions for a meat to be halal, one, you have to mention the name of Allah, two, you have to slaughter it. Three, the person slaughtering it has to be a Muslim, Jew, or Christian. Any other religion is unacceptable. Now, the Christians slaughter, and they bring us the food, but we don't know what they had mentioned, whether it's the name of Jesus or the name of Allah. It doesn't matter. The default is it is halal, unless proven otherwise. So, coming back again to your question, someone presents me with food. I look. Is this food Veg or non-veg? If it is 
vegetables, fruits, candies, cakes, whatever, bread. It doesn't matter what they mentioned the name of. They mentioned the name of jinn, shayateen. The food itself is halal. I can say bismillah and eat it. If it is non-veg, it's an animal. I have to look into the animal. Is it pork? It's haram by default. Is it lions? Is it monkeys? Is it dogs? Is it cats? Haram by default. No, it is beef or camel or mutton, sheep. Okay, then I have to look into the origin of it. Who's presenting it to me? It's a Christian or a Jew. Their slaughtering is halal for me. I can eat. It's a Muslim. I can eat. It says some other religion. Mm, I have to refrain. I have to investigate how it was slaughtered. Once I am assured that it is Islamically proper, I can then eat it and Allah knows best. And uh, Namshek, uh, someone asks, is it okay if I perform ablution naked? <laughs> if people are not looking, no problem. I'll be my guest. Uh, ablution has nothing to do whether you are fully covered or totally naked. Evolution is washing your hands, your face, your arms, wiping over your head and washing your feet. It doesn't matter with whether you are clothed or not. So to answer your question, it, it is totally permissible. Assalamu alaikum. I was once employed by a company as a software engineer to build apps for them. One app I worked on was similar to GoFundMe, where anyone can financially contribute to people's needs. It was during the building that it was during the building the app that I got to know that the total money contributed can have interest on it. Although I no longer work with them, was a salary I earned during the time haram and have and do I have to be paid back? Do I have to pay them back? So I did not understand the point with the interest. Yeah, yeah, I think he opened an application uh, like GoFundMe, but he now realized that uh, there is interest attached to it. So what, what he, kind of interest? He didn't specify. Maybe he can specify. Okay, more. generally speaking, an app that is both used in halal and haram, as long as you don't know what is going to be used in, it's halal. As long as you did not know that they will charge interest or give interest or it would have any involvement in interest you just built a wallet for them there's nothing wrong in that it's like saying sheikh i used to sell house utensils and i sold someone a knife and he killed someone with that knife am i sinful and is my money and income haram that says no when you sold him the knife did you know that he was going to use it in haram I said, no. Is knives only used in haram? So, no. The, generally speaking, it's only mostly used in halal, cutting meat, cutting bread, using it to eat, uh, cutting vegetables. In this case, there's nothing on you, inshallah. Mashallah. Sheikh, is it permissible in Islam to have the intention of the total number of children one wants to have? Meaning limiting it? Yeah, like now I would just say, okay, I want to just have four children. Khalas. After four children, I don't want to have more children. No, this is not as per the sunnah. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu was salam, tanahkahu, tanasalu tawaladu. Get married, reproduce, have children. For I will boast the nations with my own followers on the Day of Judgment. So the Prophet would boast against other messengers telling them, look, my followers are more than your followers. So the Prophet instructed us to have children. And only those secularists or those affected by their ideas would say, no, 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 this is wrong. It's best to have good quality than quantity. To have two or three children and raise them well, better than to have 15 and they're all scum and burden on the society and the community. This is nonsense. There are so many couples I know that have only one child and this child is the most evil and deviant child ever. 
They tried everything and nothing worked. Well, not only that, Nuh, peace be upon him, tried everything with his son. And his son drowned in the flood, refusing to go with his father on the ark. Why? Because guidance in the hand of Allah. It's not in yours and mine. I know a lot of people who have a dozen or more of children. And they're all righteous, practicing, mashallah, uh, a coolness to the eyes. I know one of the shiuch here in Saudi. He's over 70 years of age. He has so many children. Two of them are PhD holders and they are da'is themselves, are very well known da'is in Saudi. When you are a scholar and you find your children being scholars or being productive or being positive elements of the community, this is excellent. So limiting the number of children saying, okay, three is enough. That's a wrap. Let's call it a wrap. And that's uh, cut all tubes and, and, and whatever is needed to reproduce. No, this is not permissible. It's haram. Now, Sheikh, when praying Salah, wish you are expected to recite aloud, but you mistakenly recite silently or vice versa, what should you do? Does it require sujood sahu? First of all, sujood sahu is only required if you make a mistake with a mandatory act or a pillar. Mandatory act, such as saying Subhana Rabbi al Azim in Ruku', Subhana Rabbi al A'la in Sujood, saying Allahu Akbar when you move from one place to the other, saying Sami Allahu Liman Hamidah, Rabbana wa laka alhamd, sitting the first tashahud, saying at Tahiyatu Lillah, the first one. All of these are mandatory acts. If you make a mistake, if you did not say it, if you put it in somewhere else, you have to perform sujood al sahu Pillars are like reciting the Fatiha, standing up for prayer, doing rukur, doing sujood, sitting between the two sajda, uh, doing the last tashahud, uh, saying Allahu Akbar in the beginning and saying Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi in the end. These are pillars. If you make a mistake in them, you have to rectify it in the same prayer and, and offer it. And then pray sujood or offer sujood as sahu Things that are voluntary are sunnah they do not require sujood sahu whether you do them by mistake or intentionally for example i'm standing to pray i say allahu akbar sheikh you didn't raise your hands yeah i know oh sheikh this is not permissible pray offer to sujood sahu no this is sunnah saying allahu akbar in the beginning is the pillar so if I don't raise my hands, I'm not sinful. In Dhuhr, reciting the Fatiha in the first two rak'ahs is Sunnah. Silently. The Fatiha itself is a pillar, but reciting it silently is a Sunnah. If someone comes into the masjid, and this happened so many times, the Imam comes to lead the Dhuhr, he says, Allahu Akbar, and his mind is somewhere else. Or somewhere else. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And everybody is behind him. What is this? This is Dhur. What is he doing? So they say, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. And then he wakes up. He continues the prayer normally. Is he obliged to pray or offer two sujood of sahu? No. In Maghrib, the Imam comes, Allahu Akbar. And he recites the Fatiha silently. And, and the people are waiting. Well, what is he doing? We're waiting to hear the Quran. And he says, Allahu Akbar, and goes for rukur. No problem. The prayer is totally valid, and there is no sujood itself for that. I hope this answers your question. Now, uh, Sheikh, I couldn't fast last Ramadan as I was pregnant. I couldn't pay it back as I am breastfeeding now. And you Ramadan, were pregnant? No, no, she was pregnant. <laughs> and then you have to say that in the beginning, Akhi, right? And you don't get me confused. I'm having second thoughts. Okay. <laughs> So a, a, a woman saying that woman she was that she couldn't fast last Ramadan as she was pregnant. Uh, she couldn't pay it back because she's breastfeeding now and uh, Ramadan is here. Should, uh, she said, do I need to do fidya for the last Ramadan that I didn't pay back? Jazakallah khair. There is no fidya. The most authentic opinion among scholars 
is that there is no fidya for a woman who is pregnant or breastfeeding. So this means that a woman who heard my previous two answers and she said to her husband, okay, the sheikh says we have to continue bringing children. And she brings children, breastfeeds them, then gets pregnant again, breastfeeds them and gets pregnant again for 10, 15 years. So she comes and says, Sheikh, 30 days by 15, these are 450 days to make up. Do I have to pay any expiation or feeding any food? No, nothing. Once the obstacles are gone, you have to uh, make up for these missed days to your convenience. We don't tell you for 50 days, fast them in a row. No, fast every Monday, every Thursday, the white days, day on, day off, depending on your ability. And you can make it up, inshallah, with a year or two or three maximum. But there is no sin on you. And saying that you have to reproduce does not mean that you do not plan. I didn't say that you get pregnant, you suckle, you get pregnant nine months later on while still suckling your child and have them on top of each other. No. You get pregnant, you give birth, take a year and a half off so that you can breastfeed, the child grows. Once the child is a, a year and a half or so, you can get pregnant again. So your body is more relaxed and you've regained your strength and you can live. No one said that you have to have them all in a row. Yes. Nam uh, Sheikh, this question is say, please, uh, Sheikh, I need more clarification on the question about making a video of helping the vulnerable one because what was asked, what if the money is from the public, meaning the video is for each donor to see where this donation went to? Akhi, it doesn't matter whether it is from people that those who were filmed do not know about or not. The issue is with the human dignity, with the honor of those who were uh, uh, videoed. So if I were to tell you, I'd like to videotape you when you are sick and dying or you are on your bed sick and suffering so that we can get donations for this or for that would you allow it most people say no i don't allow people to take me when i'm weak and vulnerable and use such footage so this is what counts and allah Azza wa knows listen this is my opinion by the way Okay, Sheikh. Uh, alaikum. I cannot fast due to medical condition, but I often feel guilty. I know it is a test from Allah. How do I do? How do I deal with this guilt? This medical condition, my friend, is either chronic, which means that the doctors say you will never ever recover from, and this would remain with you till the end of your life, or they would say that inshallah, in a couple of years, three years, you will be fit to fast again. If it's the latter, then there is no problem in you skipping the fasting days until you recover, like the sister who was pregnant or suckling. And then you can make it up when there are no obstacles for you to make them up. But if you're the first, which is a chronic illness, like dialysis, like something to do with blood pressure or with uh, diabetes that if you don't eat every couple of hours you would faint and probably die in this case this is chronic in this case yes you don't fast but you feed after every day a, a, a enough food for one poor person so if you delay it until the end of the month and you feed 30 persons that would be sufficient by giving each one 1.125 kilogram of rice or you just simply cook a lot of good food and invite 30 pe poor people to eat from it now check uh, next question is if you make the intention of memorizing the quran and you're working towards it and you die do you get the reward of being a hafiz did not get that if you memorize the quran if you're on the verge of wanting to memorize the Quran and you pass away, do you die as a Hafiz? Do you get the reward of being a Hafiz? No, you, you tried, but you did not die as a Hafiz. And you will be rewarded for your intention. And when you ask such questions, 
it gives me the impression that you have the ability to say, oh, okay, if I'm not going to die as a hafiz, I'm not going to die today. Die another day. This is something in Allah's hands. Allah rewards us for our intentions. But definitely those who memorize the Quran and they memorize it fully, Allah Azza wa Jal would make their level in paradise at the last ayah they recited and memorized. So inshallah, he will be treated well. She should not, he should not fear any injustice from Allah, the Almighty Azza wa Jal. Um, can one collect money from someone whom you know is it his source of income is haram as a gift? Basically, his source of income is haram, but loves to give charity even to the masjid and the needy people. Also, he is not a Muslim, but gives charity to everyone regardless. Money or haram money is either haram for itself or haram for the way it is earned. Money that is haram for itself is either stolen or taken by force. This money, you cannot utilize it if given to you as a gift. You must not accept it. And it's haram for you if you take it. Even as charity, we cannot take it. So someone comes to me and says, Sheikh, this is Nasser's car. I'd like to give it for da'wah. And he says, okay, where's Nasser? Well, Nasser is in Nigeria. He's in Kano. And I stole it from him. I cannot accept that. There is another way of haram money, which is haram for the way being earned. So a prostitute makes money. The money itself is haram, not because of itself. Rather, because of the way it was earned. Someone who sells drugs or has a bar and sells alcohol, the money he earns is haram according to it, the way it was earned. Someone who deals with riba and he lends people money and he gets riba. The haram money is haram because of its, the way of it, it was earned. It is haram upon the person who earns it. Once he gives it to anyone else, it becomes halal to everyone else. So if he gives me a gift, I accept it. If he gives a donation to the masjid, we will accept it. Because the haram money is haram to its way of earning, not due to its nature. And Allah knows best. Um, uh, Sheikh, can my wife correct my recitation when she is praying behind me during an obligatory prayer or tarawih? Secondly, if, if I make a mistake in my prayer, like missing a rakah, how can she call my attention? Does she say subhanallah or clap her palms? The scholars say that if a woman is praying with her mahram and there is other non-mahram, she must not speak. She just claps to bring his attention to this mistake. But if she's praying with other mahram, other women, and they're all her mahram male, she can correct him by raising her voice. Likewise, if he makes a mistake, she has the uh, liberty to say subhanallah, like men usually do, or to clap. Either way is permissible because why not saying subhanallah is permissible for her is the reason is not there anymore. There are no non-mahram for her to clap. So she can say subhanallah without any problem. Okay, mashallah, tabarakallah. Uh, just to take a few questions and then we end for today, inshallah. How many? Just, to, just so that I can uh, adjust my timing. Okay, uh, just two, inshallah. I have no problem. Go ahead. None. So, uh, Shia, how can I get over shaitan making me feel good when people see me doing good act, even if my initial intention is uh, is good, I feel it is real. Should I just make istighfar and Allah will accept all are my good deeds, uh, all are my deeds good because I felt good? Some Are they going to be terrible because I felt good? I, do I lose the reward? First of all, if you were to ask me about my CV, I would probably give you two to three pages. 
And I have worked in many positions. I have many training courses in the corporate world, of course, not in the Islamic uh, world, but in, in, in companies. And you would think that, mm, mashallah, Sheikh Asim is well versed in public relations and human resources. This is my specialty. But if you were to ask Satan to give you his, his CV, it would be in the hundreds of thousands of pages. Because his experience ranges from the time of Adam, peace be upon him, till the current date. So he knows exactly what makes you tick. If he sees that you're careful about religious commitment, he would go to extremes. Washing your arms three times is not enough. Make it, give it a fourth time just to be safe. So instead of making wudu in three minutes, you end up making wudu in half an hour. And every day you add another minute or two. Then he comes and says, why make wudu if you're not sure that you've washed the organs properly? Make ghusl for every salah. And he remains and continues to harden things for you because you open the door for him. Until he makes you abandon salat altogether. Leave salat, leave deen. And this is what I do counseling for. I do a lot of counseling sessions with people who are almost having OCD and they are going a bit towards insanity. We give them such eye openers like this and with the grace of Allah Azza wa they are well again. On the other side, there are people who are not religiously committed. So he goes to them and say, why wash your arms to begin with? Half of the arm is enough. Akhi, this area did, is not washed. Says, it's okay. Allah is ghafoorun rahim. Allah is most forgiving. Akhi, you prayed Asr three rakahs. Did I? Yes, yeah, okay. Allah. Okay, you have to pray the fourth. No, 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 no. Allah will accept that. And he indulges in fitna, indulges in sins, mixing with women, drinking, people watching movies, listening to music until they leave salat totally and become liberals, secularists, whatever you call them. So now you come and always ask yourself, I did something good. It was for the sake of Allah. People are praising me. What should I do? Okay. Who, um, I hear you. Uh, do you mind asking me, who's talking to me? Who's telling me this? Who's giving me advice about whether I did something good or not, it, whether it was sincere or not? Is it an angel or Satan? You will immediately answer yourself by saying, no, this is Satan. If it's Satan, don't listen to him. I am giving a lecture on Zoom about usul al-thalatha. I get people sending me messages. Jazakallahu khayran, very beneficial. We have learned so much of you. I love you for the sake of Allah, blah, blah, blah. My head is getting bigger and bigger and bigger like a balloon, boom, it explodes. I tell myself before going tonight, uh, to bed that night, hmm, praising people is good. I feel good when they praise me. When they say that we've benefited from you, you have changed my life. I feel so fulfilled. Am I doing it for the sake of Allah or not? <gasps> Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm doing Riyah. I'm showing off. I like people to praise me. Why aren't they saying that he is the sheikh, the scholar, the knowledgeable, the this and that? Why people are not kissing my head or forehead when they meet me? They're not respecting me. Oh, I'm not doing this for the sake of Allah. I'm doing it for fame. I'm doing it for being renowned among the people. When I get these thoughts, I sit in my bed, not literally, but figure of speech. And I say, I hear what you're saying, my friend, but can you please identify yourself? Are you an angel or you, are you a shaitan? I don't get a reply because he does not identify himself. Sometimes I'm sitting and I get these whispers. You have four hours of no commitment. 
Why don't you go wear your ihram, make umrah? So I said, I hear what you're saying, my friend, but can you please identify yourself? Are you an angel or a shaitan? I would definitely get the answer back. Even if he doesn't answer, I will answer myself. No, this is an angel. No doubt about it. He's telling me to do something good. So, Akhi, when you get these whispers of shaitan, and you know that they are from shaitan, his only objective is to make you stop doing good things. And if you do stop doing good things, you become one of his soldiers. So whenever he comes to you, tell him, ha, 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 I know who you are. I'm going to double it next time just to make you unhappy and angry. And you keep on doing good things for the sake of Allah, knowing that no one knows you. No matter how many people praise you on earth and say so many good things about you, only you know yourself better than anyone else. So even if you say, Sheikh Hasim, you're a righteous person, you're a, a kind person, you are, mashallah, a scholar of all scholars. <laughs> I know myself. So who are you fooling? No matter what you say, I know that I'm not a scholar and this is why I keep on repeating I am not a scholar. We are just students of knowledge, collectors of knowledge from authentic places here and there. Allah only blessed me to be famous because I come on TV channels and because I speak a little bit of English that allows me to explain like any teacher would and Allah knows best. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, Sheikh, is the uh, same already from here. So inshallah we're gonna, gonna end for today and uh, we hope to have you by next weekend inshallah yeah we, uh, i think we will uh hopefully do it on friday saturday and sunday oh mashallah tabarakallah mashallah okay. it's been beautiful having you barakallah feekum jazakum allah khair wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh all right, Alhamdulillah. Uh, thank you so much all for coming in. So inshallah, there's a link I've been posting earlier. Please, can you just follow it and ask your question? Um, inshallah, since the Sheikh is going to be available, I will speak to him. Or we can get Friday alone just for Q and A. So maybe we can have two hours Friday alone just for Q and A because there's a lot of questions uh, coming in. So inshallah, maybe on Friday we have two hours or three hours Q and A. And on uh, we continue the class on Saturday and uh, Sunday, insha Allah. So I will just repost the link again uh, for you to follow and then ask your questions in the link, insha Allah, using the link. So thank you so so much all for listening. We ask Allah that He make this uh, knowledge beneficial. And uh, our next class will be on Tuesday, insha Allah. We'll communicate the dates to you, and we'll be having usul al fiqh with Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah. Inshallah, and uh, we will last for two days or so. And we have a millennial topic to discuss that will be on gender roles, which will come on Thursday. Inshallah, if Allah will. So please, uh, if you haven't gotten any message from us, please do uh, message me on Instagram. If you have my Instagram page at nshrain, please message me and uh, I will send you the registration link so you can register. So you, on your Instagram, you can check nshrain. You can message me and we'll send you the whatever you need that is necessary. Inshallah. Uh, thank you so much. We like feedbacks from you as well. So if you can send the feedback to the email we we'll sent to you, that would be really nice. Inshallah. So may Allah bless you. We love you all. May Allah accept this from us. We want to thank each and everyone who has contributed to this uh, beautiful movement. May Allah bless them. May Allah grant them the highest rank in Jannah and grant us all successful ending. For me, I love you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.